Lucy Parsons, The Agitator, December 15, 1911. The Haymarket meeting is referred to historically as the Haymarket Anarchist riot. There was no riot at the Haymarket except a police riot. Mayor Harris had attended the Haymarket meeting and took the stand at the anarchist trial for the defense, not for the state. The Great Strike of May 1886 was an historic event of great importance in as much as it was. The first time that the workers themselves had attempted to get a shorter workday by united simultaneous action. This strike was the first in the nature of direct action on a large scale. Of course, the eight hour day is as antiquated as the craft unions themselves. Today, we should be agitating for a five hour workday. The Industrial Worker, May 1st, 1912. The 11th of November has become a day of international importance, cherished in the hearts of all true lovers of liberty as a day of martyrdom. On that day was offered to the gallows tree martyrs as true to their ideal as ever were sacrificed in any age. Our comrades were not murdered by the state because they had any connection with the bomb throwing, but because they were active in organizing the wage slaves. The capitalist class didn't want to find the bomb thrower. This class foolishly believed that by putting to death the active spirits of the labor movement of the time, it could frighten the working class back to slavery. The Agitator, November 1st, 1912. Parsons, Spies, Ling, Fisher, and Engel. Although all that is mortal of you is laid beneath that beautiful monument in Wildham Cemetery. You are not dead. You are just beginning to live in the hearts of all true lovers of liberty. For now, after 40 years that you are gone, thousands who were then unborn are eager to learn of your lives and heroic martyrdom. And as the years lengthen and brighter will shine your names and the more you will come to be appreciated and loved. Those who so foolishly murdered you under the forms of law, lynch law, in a court of supposed justice are forgotten. Rest, comrades, rest. All the tomorrows are yours. The Labor Defender, November 1926. Once again, on November 11th, a memorial meeting will be held to commemorate the death of the Chicago Haymarket Martyrs. 1937 is the 50th anniversary, and this meeting bids far to be more widely observed than any of the 49 previous ones. On that gloomy morning of November 11th, 1887, I took our two little children to jail to bid my beloved husband farewell. I found the jail roped off with heavy cables. Policemen with pistols walked in the enclosure. I asked them to allow us to go to our loved one before they murdered him. They said nothing. Then I said, let these children bid their father goodbye. Let them receive his blessing. They can do no harm. In a few minutes, a patrol wagon drove up, and we were locked up in a police station while the hellish deed was done. Oh, misery, I have drunk thy cup of sorrow to its dregs, but I am still a rebel. The One Big Union Monthly, November 1937. Two Tramps, the Unemployed, the Disinherited and the Miserable by Lucy E. Parson. Written in The Alarm, October 4th, 1884. Assured, it has been printed and redistributed um, not only by the International Work and People's Association, but I'm sure by others. Two Tramps, The Unemployed, The Disinherited, and miserable. A word to the 35,000 now tramping the streets of this great city, with hands in pockets gazing listlessly about you at the evidence of wealth and pleasure of which you own no part, not sufficient even to purchase yourself a bit of food with which to appease the pangs of hunger, now knowing at your vitals. It is with you and the hundreds of thousands of others similarly situated in this great nation. Land of plenty that I wish to have a word. 
Have you not worked hard all your life? Since you were old enough for your labor to be of use in the production of wealth? Have you not toiled long, hard, and laborlessly in producing wealth? And in all those years of drudgery, do you not know you have produced thousands upon thousands of dollars worth of wealth, which you did not then, do not now, and unless you act, will never own any part in? Do you not know that when you were harnessed to a machine and that machine harnessed to steam and thus you toil your 10, 12 and 16 hours in the 24 that during this time in all these years you received only enough of your labor product to furnish yourself the bare course necessities of life and that when you wish to purchase anything for yourself and family it always had to be of the cheapest quality. If you wanted to go anywhere, you had to wait until Sunday. So little did you receive for your unremitting toil that you dare not stop for a moment as it were. And do you not know that with all your squeezing, pinching, and economizing, you never were enabled to keep but a few days ahead of the wolves of want? And that at last, when the caprice of your employer saw fit to create an artificial famine by limiting production, that the fires in the furnace were extinguished, the iron horse to which you had been harnessed was stilled, the factory door locked up, you turned upon the highway a tramp with hunger in your stomach and rags upon your back. Yet your employer told you that it was overproduction which made him close up. Who cared for the bitter tears and heart pangs of your loving wife and helpless children when you bid them a loving God bless you and turned upon the tramper's road to seek employment elsewhere? I say, who cared for those heartaches and pains? Who were only a tramp now to be execrated and denounced as a worthless tramp and a vagrant? By that very class who had been engaged all those years in robbing you and yours. Then can you not see that the good boys are the bad boys, cuts no figure whatever. That you are the common prey of both, and that their mission is simply robbery. Can you not see that it is the industrial system, and not the boss, which must be changed? Now, when all these bright summer and autumn days are going by and you have no employment and consequently can save up nothing. And when the winter's blast sweeps down from the north and all the earth is wrapped in a shroud of ice, hearken not to the voice of the hypocrite who will tell you that it was ordained of God, that the poor ye have always, or to the arrogant robber who will say to you that you drank up all your wages last summer when you had work. And that is the reason why you have nothing now. And that the workhouse or the workyard is too good for you. That you ought to be shot and shoot. You, they will if you present your petitions in too empathetic a manner. So hearken not to them, but list. Next winter. When the cold blasts are creeping through the rents in your seedy garments. When the frost is biting your feet through the holes in your worn out shoes. And when all wretchedness seems to have centered in and upon you. When misery has marked you for her own and life has become a burden and existence a mockery. When you have walked the streets by day and slept upon hard boards by night. And at last determined by your own hand to take your life. For you would rather go out into utter nothingness than to long endure an existence which has become such a burden. So perchance, you determine to dash yourself into the cold embrace of the lake rather than longer suffer thus. But halt before you commit this last tragic act in the drama of your sample existence. Stop. Is there nothing you can do to ensure those whom you are about to orphan against a like fate? The waves will only dash over you in mockery of your rash act, but stroll you down the avenues of the rich and look through the magnificence, plate windows, until their voluptuous homes. And here you will discover the very identical robbers who have despoiled you and yours. Then let your tragedy be enacted here.
Awaken them from their Watan sport at your expense. Send forth your petition and let them read it by the red glare of destruction. Thus, when you cast one long lingering look behind, you can be assured that you have spoken to these robbers in that only language which they have ever been able to understand, for they have never yet denied to notice any petition from their slaves that they were not compelled to read by the red glare bursting from the cannon's mouths or that was not handed to them upon the points of the sword. You need to organization when you make up your mind to present this kind of position. In fact, an organization would be a detriment to you. But each of you hungry tramps who read these lines avail yourselves of those little methods of warfare which science has placed in the hands of the poor man and you will become a power in this or any other land. Learn the use of what they do to exploit you. That last word, exploit, is not the word that Lucy Parsons used, but I will not use the word that she used in our times as today. And I can understand with dedicating my narration of the tramps by Miss Lucy E. Parsons, that it is evident that they have strategically designed even a way that we are restricted to speak freely or even expressively artistically to assert our claims of an abolishment of an, a denial of a deprivation that is continuing through our generations and hurting us. People, open your eyes. It is a day of a new protest. It is a day of a new beginning because we are not going to be no ladies in tramps in the streets on the corners.